Leviticus chapter 10 verse 8 to 11. Leviticus 10 verse 8 to 11. The Lord then spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you. When you come into the tent of meeting, so that you will not die, it is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and clean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. So only here in the entire book of Leviticus does God speak directly to Aaron. All other times the Lord spoke through Moses. So in Numbers there are incident, inc incidences where um, the Lord spoke to prophet Moses and Aaron. So why did he speak to Moses? It came through as a counsel to Aaron that God has not abandoned him. So one side he is a God of justice and the other side he's a God who has like a mother figure who embraces, who welcomes, who does not, you know, forget about the child or his child. He's always there to remember. He was an assurance. It's an assurance of his love that he had upon Aaron. Yes, much of this thing happened, but still my love is there for you. So God admonishes priests not to drink wine, no liqueur. Um, which one, when one is serving God. But these are things we see happening today. We are seeing it happening today. There is an Asian Jewish interpretation taught that Nadab and Abihu were intoxicated and they lost their senses of judgment when they came before God. That's what an Asian Jewish interpretation says. So when you look at it, why would God counsel Aaron and his two sons not to drink after this incident? Meaning that there's some bit of what? Message there. There's some bit of, of message which we can say maybe that Jewish interpretation could be right. Because why is it after the burial of all this thing, this message comes that the Lord then spoke to Aaron saying, do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you when you come into the tent of meeting so that you will not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. Could it mean that Nadab and Abihu took strong drink and then they went to the tabernacle and that's where God struck them? So a lot of things, you know, they lit the wrong fire. Was it because they were intoxicated with a brew and um, they were not in their senses? So this verse is teaching us a lot, a lot, a lot of things. So churches, the members, the leaders, the deacons are counsel not to get addicted to wine. We are not to get addicted to wine. When you read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, First Timothy chapter 3, actually, let's go there and see. Not given to wine, no striker, no greedy or filthy liquor, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. So we have to accept what we have and move with what we have. Verse 8 says, likewise, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy, liquor so drinking is not good at all it's not good at all drinking is not good at all for a leader a church leader a pastor a deacon a priest whatever it is it's not good because the bible says our body is the temple of the living god and so we should guard it jealously we should be in the right frame of mind to guide and counsel people. We should be in the right frame of mind to be in position to hear what God is saying so that we may implement it. That's why we have to be sober 24-7. So priests were not just men who offered sacrifices, but they were also teachers. They were also teachers. The priest was holding the twofold office. They were teachers and also priests. So spiritually, what message do we get here? The priests were also teachers in the Old Testament. In the fivefold ministry, we have the pastors, the teachers, they were clubbed together. And when you read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it tells us everything about that fivefold ministry. But the teachers and the pastors are clubbed together, meaning that a pastor must have a teaching, uh, you know, a, a, a teaching aspect within them. And, and, um, 
when you look at individuals, uh, they are complementary, but a pastor can be a teacher and the reverse. A pastor can be a teacher and the reverse. So priests were to teach the people the differences between the holy and unholy. They were to teach the people which is acceptable to God and what is not acceptable to God. So the right from the wrong, all that was supposed to be taught by the priests to the people. The priests were to be teachers of righteousness, leading and guiding people to live a righteous life, an upright life that is well-pleasing before God. And when you look at Nehemiah chapter 8 from verse 5 to 8, the Levites translated the book for the people to understand the reading, to understand the reading. So the right and the wrong, the clean and unclean outlined in the Old Testament is also affirmed in the New Testament. When we read Acts of Apostles chapter 15, uh, 15 verse 28 and 29. Let's go to Acts of Apostles chapter 15, verse 28 and 29. Verse 28 says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. So you see this was a warning given in the New Testament. So we cannot say that ah, it was an Old Testament thing. It still continued to the New Testament. So a high standard of holiness, discipline, and order is required of the New Testament believer. Uh, let us look at the someone on the Mount teachings. Someone on the Mount teachings. Um, we shall get um, maybe time after we finish this series uh, when Jesus tarries. And uh, grace is still there for us to reach out to as many. Uh, we shall teach the someone on the mount. Very, very important because this is the life of Christ. And this is um, the standard we have to understand for us to be in position to prepare ourselves. When you read Matthew chapter 5 verse 27 to 28, the New Testament is a higher standard of discipline, holiness, and order. So Matthew 5, 31 to 32 Jesus quoted the Old Testament laws and then said, but I say unto you, but I say unto you. So a demand for greater commitment is expected from us. A demand for greater commitment is expected from us because the blood of Jesus Christ is upon the tablets of our hearts. Each time we even partake of the communion, each time we go before him on the altar, we should have that at the back of our mind. So the finger of God has written it in our hearts. So a higher standard is now required and therefore let us strive towards perfection. Let us strive for perfection, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is what uh, 2 Corinthians 7 1 says. We have to strive for perfection uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So holiness is to be perfected. So here where we keep saying, ah, we are human beings, there's no one perfect and no one can ever be perfect and no one, that one gives you a, mind, a mindset and an attitude of laziness and it makes you sluggish and not take things serious. But when you commit it upon yourself, by the time you get to what the scripture is saying, you find it's practically actually working in your life because you have put it upon yourself and you have taken the step and move. Second Timothy 2.5 also says the same. God demands holiness from us. And when you look at it, it is something we have to work towards. Holiness is in the spirit. Holiness in the spirit. Holiness on the body. Holiness of the mind, the soul. It's a threefold, three in one, all together. So the Bible talks about filthiness in the spirit and uncleanness on the body. So we should put away anything that is causing that commotion. Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus 10. We are going to read uh, verse 12 to 15. Leviticus 10 from verse 12 to 15. Then Moses spoke to Aaron and to his surviving sons, Eleazar and Itama. Take the grain offering that is left over from the Lord's offerings by fire and eat it and live in beside the altar, for it is most holy. 
you shall eat it moreover in a holy place because it is your due and your sons due out of the lord's offerings by fire for thus i have i have been commanded the breast of the wave offering however and the thigh of the offering you may eat in a clean place you and your sons and your daughters with you for they have been given as your due and your sons due out of the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the son of Israel the thigh offered by lifting up and the breast offered by waving they shall bring along with the offerings by fire of the portion of fat to present as a wave offering before the Lord so it shall be a thing perpetually due to you and your sons with you just as the Lord has commanded so when you read these verses we've read twice in this scripture it states as the Lord has commanded me. The Lord has commanded. So we should always ask the Lord to lead us and guide us to do with the task and instructions of his work. To lead us and guide us in anything that we are going to do for the Father. We should always be led by the Holy Spirit. When you serve God in, in, in full-time ministry, in sincerity and truthfully, God will always take care of you. God will take care of your household. God can never let you stranded. He can never. I'm talking this out of experience. So our own is to love him truly, sincerely. There is nothing God cannot do. We should keep our hands clean so that when we are praying and interceding for others, God will answer the prayers. In the book of Job, he says that when our hands are clean and we are praying for those who are guilty through intercession, God will answer the prayers. So we are the ones supposed to make sure our hands are pure and are clean. The pastors, the ministers, the leaders. And we the believers who are the ones standing in the gap of our families, our households. We need to live a clean and pure life. So when we go and look at it, the meal offering was to be eaten by the priests. It is the final act in sacrifices. So Moses reminds Aaron and his sons that despite the disaster of Nadab and Abihu's death, their priestly privileges are not forfeited. Their priestly privileges are not forfeited. So when you look at the Christology bit of it, it is for this reason Jesus asked us to eat the bread and drink wine. This is the reason why Jesus asked us to eat the bread and drink wine. The wine, Luke 22. Let's go to Luke 22. And we shall read verse 19 and 20. Luke 22, verse 19 and 20. Luke 22, verse 19 and 20. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and said to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So when you look at it, this uh, whole point for us to take his, it is bread and wine, it is his body, his flesh, in remembrance of him. And this one will help us to be conscious. This person gets into us. He begins to convict us. He begins to talk to us. He begins to remind us. He walks with us within us. He begins to sit in us and begins to talk to us. We hear his voice. So, and he also said that we can do nothing without him. He said we can do nothing without him. So, when he says whenever we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we are eating his food indeed and drinking blood indeed. For drinking it, having drink indeed, and having food indeed. And he said, when we don't eat his flesh and drink his blood, we do not have eternal life. We will not live. So all the package, all the advantages that touch to it is something we should not take for granted, something we shouldn't take for granted at all. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 10 from verse 16 to 20. Leviticus 10, verse 16 to 20. But Moses searched carefully for the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it had been burned up. So he was angry with Aaron's surviving sons, Eliezer and Itamar. It 
saying, Why did you not eat the sin offering at the holy place? For it is most holy, and he gave it to you to bear away the guilt of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, since its blood had not been brought inside into the sanctuary, you shall certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary just as I commanded. Verse 19, but Aaron spoke to Moses, Behold, this very day they presented their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. When things like this happened to me, if I had eaten a sin offering today, would it have been good in the sight of the Lord? When Moses had that, it seemed good in his sight, meaning Aaron had gotten back to his position and was sober enough to be in position to differentiate. So the Moses, uh, prophet Moses uh, bearing, f being faithful in all of God's house was always diligent and careful in carrying out the requirements of God. Very, very careful of carrying out the requirements of God. So Aaron's two other sons made the mistake of burning the goat instead of eating it. So Aaron, having lost his two eldest sons, pleaded pardon for his son's negligence. He had to plead the pardon, go back to God, you know. And Moses' anger subsided and accepted uh, Aaron's plea in humility and contrition. So Aaron had to go back and plead and say, just show mercy for these boys. Remember, his two sons have died. He has not even buried them. A warning comes is if he's to go there, he will die. Now the two sons, instead of them to eat the goat, they again burnt it. Another error, mistake. If it was our time, they would have said they have fired what? Evil arrow upon them. So the question is, why were the sons just falling in error? These ones were there. Had they recovered from the loss of their brothers? And panic and fear was in them that they misinterpreted. What was the problem? You see? So caution is needed. So Moses' anger subsided after Aaron had spoken to him. It subsided and he came down. And... Um, he accepted uh, Aaron's uh, plea in humility and contrition. So when you look at mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Uh, this is what James chapter 2 verse 13 says, that mercy shall triumph over judgment. So spiritually, what message do we get here as we, the last day's believer? God is more gracious to those who make mistakes because they fear him than those who carelessly and irrelevantly enter into his presence. Let us take note of that. God is more gracious to those who make mistakes because they fear him. When you notice you fear him, you're doing things and you make mistakes, you go back before him in humility, very fast reconcile, that is no problem. Than those who are carelessly and irrelevantly entering the presence, they arrogantly enter the presence of God. You try to warn them. They feel they are up there. They're in cloud nine. Nobody can talk to them. Nobody can say anything to them. Those who understand high chances of facing his wrath. So we must have the mind of God in every situation because God's mercy may overrule in some cases. God's mercy may overrule in some cases. So we should never, never, never Use our own wisdom to resolve matters in ministry. We should always pray and ask the Holy Spirit. At times, God's mercy may overrule. In some cases, at times, by the time you think you're going to cry for mercy, it would be too late. So we should not take things for granted and assume. So Jesus forgiving the adulterous woman in the Gospel of John chapter 8 from verse 3 to 11. It is about coming to realization that all... Oh, this is my problem. This is my battle. But I came to you because I know it is my problem. So I want you to help me. Help me. We have to go helplessly before God. Showing him that we are helpless. There is nothing much we can do. Without him we are nothing. Jesus said that in the gospel of John. That we can do nothing without him. So God is his great, great God in his great grace and mercy. At times, he makes allowances for standing to listen to a crime, an offense, or a fault of somebody, or a, a, a circumstance of, of a person, just to, to see, okay, does this person, is this person remote? What is going on? What is happening? And that's why he's regarded too as a God who is patient. 
as a God who is kind because he has that patience and kindness. So the closer a person is to God, the stricter the standard will be judged by. And to whom much is given, much is expected. So we should always seek God for counsel. We should always seek God for counsel. We should not assume or take anything for granted. We should always seek God for counsel. So when we get back to, when you look at that Leviticus 10 verse 3, then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy and before all the people I will be honored. So when we read, um, Math, uh, sorry, when we read, let's speak it from Luke. When we look at Luke chapter 12, verse 48b, the B part, Luke 12, 48b, Jesus said, For from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. So the more tasks that are granted and given unto us, beloved, there's going to be an accountability. There's going to be and accountability. So we should not assume that hey, God is there. He's not seeing us. I can do what I want to do. There's going to be an accountability at the end of the journey. So the New Testament teaching in James chapter 1 verse 3. James chapter 3. Sorry, actually James chapter 3 verse 1. James chapter 3 verse 1. The Amplified Version. It says, my brethren, for you know that we teachers will be judged by a higher standard and with greater severity than other people. Thus we assume the greater accountability and the more condemnation. So we who are teaching have to be very careful. Are we teaching in line of the interpretation of the heavens? Is it what the Holy Spirit has given us to interpret? Or we are just talking according to what we had another man speak? And because it felt nice in our ears, we also carried it along. So we need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need to build and create time to be in his presence, to hear from God. We need to create time to be in his presence for us to be in position to get and capture here what he's saying. Very, very important because remember, whatever we receive, we are giving out to others. So any information that is wrong, misinterpreted, is going to be a catastrophe for some. And that's why this warning comes in because we are supposed to be leaders guiding, directing by the help of the Holy Spirit. To, because the Bible says the Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Father. If the Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Father, and then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, that means the Holy Spirit will bring out the clear picture of how our Lord Jesus Christ wanted to bring it. The Holy Spirit will bring the right interpretation of how God wants it to be brought out. The Holy Spirit will bring out the right concept of what Jesus Christ wanted. So it's very important for us to build that relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the more we study, remember knowledge comes in, knowledge and understanding, knowledge and understanding comes in by how much information you have got to yourself. If you don't have the information, there is no knowledge there because knowledge comes by acquired knowledge, acquired information, acquired um, information that has come upon you. Then how do you put it to use is what is very important. So beloved, that has brought us to an end of that chapter 10. Lessons to learn there. We shouldn't take God's work for granted. We shouldn't handle it with familiarity. We shouldn't take God's things lightly. Holy Spirit, the leading, the guiding is very crucial. Things of the house of God should not be familiarized with. If God spoke to you and he told you to do it and you do not do it, better go and do it. If God says stop doing it and you're doing it, stop it. Let us take the messages of God with serious caution and fear. With serious caution and fear. It is very, very important for us. So what are we going to do, we, in these last days? What are we going to do for us to be in position not to fall victim? Number one, we need to die to self. Number one, we need to die to self. Why must we die to self? When we read that scripture of what happened to the sons of, of, of Aaron, and then uh, after they were buried, God now comes and tells Aaron and his sons, 
not to drink any hard drink. It shows there was a, they were living a compromised life. It shows that these two sons could have drunk. Because why did the warning come after they have died? Meaning God was trying to say, this is what caused them to be taken. And you shouldn't follow the same route and path they have gone to. So we need to live a crucified life. We need to die to self. What are those habits that are still an addiction to you? You want to stop it, but you, you cannot stop. You need to seek counsel. You need to meet a therapist who can help you. You need to meet a therapist who can help you. Those things that are that have become part of you, that you are tired of them, but you can, they cannot easily let you go. You need to look for somebody who can help you. There is no way we can serve in the house of God and at the same time do the things of the world. It's impossible. So getting that message, it is teaching us that these people took a lot of things for granted. There was a lot of familiarity. So even though you're a member and you're not a pastor, you're not a leader, as a believer... Even though you say you're a bench warmer, still caution. If you have chosen to be for God, be for God. If you have chosen to be of the world, choose, 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 choose. Choose where you need to go. The choice has to come from you. So the number one thing we need to address is self. So you're there. You've been in salvation, but you're still battling with some character, battling with some habits. I want you to go before God. Speak to him and tell him, Father, I come before you. I come before your throne of mercy. There is this thing I'm still battling. You call it by name. Father, help me. You're there. You've never given your life to Jesus, but you've been following us online. I want to repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for me. With my mouth, I believe that you are Lord over my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving and accepting me. Father, I thank you for the lives of those souls as they have boldly confessed you as Lord and Savior. Let your mercy arise and intervene over them in the mighty name of Jesus. Any condition from their foundation that regards anyone who confesses Christ as Lord and Savior that is waiting to manifest in their lives, we command those conditions to be shattered and broken forever in the mighty name of Jesus. We release the firepower and the unction of the Almighty God. Let it rest and take charge over them in the mighty name of Jesus. I cover I seal and I soak every one of them with the blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. Praise the Lord. You get in touch with us, the contacts that are online. We have an online Bible class, the foundation class. Very important. You've given your life to Christ. You need to grow so that after that you do what our Lord Jesus Christ said you must do. You go for baptism. Very important. Many times you just go for baptism without understanding the importance of baptism. That's why we are having a lot of loopholes in the body of Christ. So let us uh, be part of that class. It's an online foundation class for those who cannot reach us physically. And then guidelines will be given on how the baptism will be done in whatever location you are. Or you can look for a Bible-believing church that teaches the word of God that you can hook yourself up into. So the rest we are going to pray like this. Oh God, my Father, anything within me that is still ruling over me, take it away in the mighty name of Jesus. Pray to the Father, pray to the Father, pray to the Father. Anything within me, that has taken up your place in my life, take it away in the mighty name of Jesus. Let him take it away by the power of the Holy Ghost. Ask him to take it away, take it away. Anything within me that has taken your place, Father, take it away in the mighty name of Jesus. Take it away by the power in the blood of Jesus. Take it away, take it away, take it away. Take it away in the name of Jesus. Father, take it away by the power and the blood of Jesus. Take it away in the name of Jesus. Take it away by the power and the blood of Jesus. Take it away. Take it away. Ask him to take it away. Anything within me that has taken your place. Father, take it away. Take it away. Take it away. Anything within me that has taken your place. Take it away in the mighty name of Jesus. Take it away by the power and the blood of Jesus. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. My Lord and my God, we want to thank you, everlasting Father. We bless your name. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. For all that you do and what you shall continue to do, Father, we say thank you. For your glory and power, your goodness and mercy, Father, we say thank you. We count anything contrary that wants to rise up against King of glory. As we have heard your word, continue to teach us everlasting Father. As we go, let your power and your presence go with us and be with us in the mighty name of Jesus. I cover Isil and I soak every one of us with the blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. The Lord keep you. The Lord shield you. The Lord bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed.